Hey, Shamir. Uh, welcome to uh, the podcast. Uh, thanks so much for coming. I'm Jonathan G. Blanco, founder of TF Blockchain. I'm here with Shamir Karkal, uh, the founder and CEO of Scylla. Uh, they do banking, payments, and stable coins. And uh, we've, we've been lucky enough to have uh, Shamir at some of our events in the past, uh, past conferences and events in Portland. I'm excited to talk to him today and talk about what's going on in the world, uh, talk about what he's doing. Uh, so please welcome uh, Shamir. Round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, John. Um, and there is definitely a lot happening uh, in the world. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a, it feels like a crazy moment to be alive. Uh, um, so there's uh, so much happening. Uh, and I don't know where to start. Maybe I should just start by telling you about myself and, and kind of the journey to Scylla. How does that sound? Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. So let's see. Um, I'm from India. Uh, was born and grew up in Bangalore. Uh, became a software engineer. Uh, although my parents were both bankers and, and kind of my family has like a long tradition in banking. <laughs> uh, and maybe that's why I didn't want, I wanted to do anything except banking and uh, became a software engineer. Uh, did that for a few years, came to the US, uh, went to business school at Carnegie Mellon. And after that, uh, I uh, studied, uh, after business school at Carnegie Mellon, I went to uh, work at a consulting firm called McKinsey and did that for a few years. Uh, is this background noise bothering you? How does it it's sound? It's not terrible. We, it's no big deal. Don't worry about it. Awesome. So I um, worked at uh, McKinsey for a few years. And then in the summer of 09, a classmate from business school, uh, a guy called uh, Josh Rich, who's a good friend, uh, he sent me an email suggesting that we should start a bank together. And uh, the reason he sent it to me was because at McKinsey, I'd spent most of my time doing consulting on for banks. So Got kind it. of understood about the financial system and he was very frustrated with it and wanted somebody who knew how it worked to explain to him why it sucked so bad uh, and then he was like let's start a bank and I was like okay and you'll see how crazy I am that in, in 09 I thought that was a good idea yeah uh, I, I was living in Europe at the time so I moved from Europe back to uh, the US in to New York in late 09 um, and you know we just come out of a financial crisis um, I, was, I was probably still going on um, and uh, and started working on creating uh, an online banking startup, which became simple. And uh, it took us a long time. It took us almost three years to actually build and launch it. Uh, but we stuck it out and, and finally figured out how to build a new bank, uh, launched it in 2012. Uh, and then uh, it grew pretty rapidly. And then in the summer of uh, the early, in early 2014, it was acquired by a Spanish bank uh, called BBVA, which is- yeah, kind of the, yeah larger banks in the world um, and um, and they're also a pretty decent size bank in the US and then uh, in the summer of 14 I was uh, in the offices of the executives at BBVA heard about this idea they had of building an API platform got very excited about it um, encouraged them to kind of do it um, because I'd seen all the problems in banking because there was no such thing as API platforms right sure um, and so, uh, long story short, I ended up running that business a year later. So yeah. I left Simple, BBVA, and built and launched a couple of API platforms, one in Spain and one in the US. Uh, and the US one is called uh, the BBVA Open Platform. It's a great platform um, and, you know, uh, wonderful people still there working on it. Uh, my frustration was that it, I could never get the internal BBVA sort of business to actually onboard customers rapidly, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. And rapidly meant in a matter of like weeks or maybe a couple of months at most, while rapidly at a bank means a matter of years, maybe three to five, right? <laughs> uh, and and so it just it just didn't work. And I uh, I left in 2017, more than a little bit frustrated. And then um, in the uh, um, in uh, started thinking about what to do with the rest of my life, right? <laughs> and in um, late 17, I kind of like we began to explore crypto again. I had looked at Bitcoin back in 2010 when I was early, the early days of Simple. Um, and uh, I was like, maybe the problem is trying to build, it, trying to build a, an API platform on top of the banking system, right? Maybe we need a different system. So I started exploring crypto and then realized that there's a, 
huge amount of functionality uh, and a really interesting sort of ecosystem of developers and people sort of working on crypto but there was right, huge right. Gaps. um and then and that's when we were like okay how would you do this if you wanted to build a program a way of building financial applications on top of a crypto platform but actually make it functional and usable in the real world and that's where sitla came from so you know well, yeah it's it's both. interesting that you saw the the opportunity there when it came to uh just how the overall banking system worked was working then and arguably probably still uh for the most part works today and you know that that's really where you saw that blockchain opportunity with Scylla. yeah sorry i didn't mean to cut you off but uh no no completely the 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 the, the, the the whole thing is like everybody now at least in the last 2 3 years or probably not 5 10 years ago is like realizes that there you know there's a massive fintech boom that has been happening in the last few years um and and, and i think people have realized that kind of when you look at the global financial system it's gigantic mm-hmm. uh, it's probably somewhere between 15 and 20 trillion dollars a year in revenue in financial services um and if you look at the entire like internet revolution um which has been going on for like 30 plus years right like the world wide web is i think 31 as of now or 30 um but like that that in that whole revolution all that the, 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 all the big guys right uh, like apple makes its money from selling phones google from advertising facebook advertising and so you're like the whole uh, the, the 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 industry that has been completely changed by the internet is is advertising yeah. um and, and you can see media and you know the uh, newspapers going bust all of that the, the entire advertising industry globally is like 600 billion in revenue um finance is at least 20 times larger maybe 30 times larger than advertising um and it totally makes sense i like the world is not built on advertising the world is built on like manufacturing agriculture uh, transportation yeah. and <laughs> and advertising is just a thin layer on top so most of those industries have not been drastically changed by the internet yet uh, and that is just beginning now sort of 30 years in that's and- a really interesting way to put it too cuz when you think about it it's almost as if advertising is is part of the distribution layer right of the infrastructure that you're talking about right being the financial systems the manufacturing the the agriculture and so forth and and so right like those industries themselves that are what's generating the need um being massive and and like you're saying with finance and and just you know the advertising side is getting the word out of it but um yeah there there's there's even still so much room for disruption in the finance space and that's obviously why crypto becomes so interesting and blockchain becomes so interesting and and even outside of crypto and blockchain just all these fintech companies that have come out you know your your previous company being one of them completely and it's it's the entire fintech crypto whatever you want to call it like everything from sort of paypal 20 years ago to to sela last year all of it put together is not 1% yet of that uh, uh 15 to 20 trillion right? totally like, totally uh, it's 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 that ma- the, the the entire global financial system is not controlled by paypal it's controlled by about 30000 banks globally um yeah. and it says like that old story right like why do you want to rob the banks because that's where the money is yeah uh, well so and, why- and you probably know this more than more than most people is um am i stuttering a little bit on the thing no okay good um so you you probably know this more than most people how um a lot of these fintech companies need to use um basic not ba- I shouldn't say basic but they basically need to use uh, a bank's charter right um to be able to tra- to operate and act as you know a banking system so if it's a fintech they're probably using some charter of maybe some quote unquote old oldy moldy type of bank can you talk about that really quickly how that works yeah i mean uh, so the uh, the people keep talking about like fintech versus crypto yeah. to me when people ask are you fintech or are you crypto i'm like yes <laughs> yeah I mean, yeah to me it, like blockchain is a technology it comes with 
a bunch of useful capabilities, uh, but that all depends on how you use it. And fintech is just one place that you might want to use blockchain as a technology. And so, right. what question? Uh, the, 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 there are sort of different people working on it, but sometimes I think there's just sort of rabid communalism uh, more than anything else. But the kind of the, um, the, 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 the real difference, if there is any, is that I think fintech always understood that financial services is heavily regulated, right? Like when you're talking about like manufacturing or agriculture, I mean, there's like physical things, right? Like yeah. there's, there's, there's crops or there's stuff that you have to ship or in transportation, you have to move people or goods, right? Like that's a real world that the internet is gonna change that, but you're not going to move, you're not going to transmit a, a shipping container on the internet, right? It yeah. has to be by a, by a ship. Um, but money has always been electronic. Long before the internet came around, the most money was virtual. And it was, uh, it was tracked on ledgers. And when the first computers came out, banks and insurers actually bought a lot of them because it was so much better to use um, the, the, a machine as a computer than a human. Up until the 1960s, the word computer was a job description for a human being. And wow. it was a, their job. There would be rooms full of people who would just add up numbers. And where did all these people work? at banks, because banks had to keep track of so much of money. Mm -hmm. And it was all ledger. On what's a ledger? It was a book. <laughs> uh, and so that people don't always realize that, that, that money has always been virtual, just like communications. So why did the internet revolutionize communications so quickly and money so slowly? Money is very heavily regulated. In the 90s, the internet was rolling out. And if you went to like a place like India and you said, hey, this internet thing is going to connect up to all your phones via dial-in and the people would have been like, so what's going to change? Well, some tech geeks are going to be able to view information. Well, we all, we all like more information. Let's do that, right? And so the internet spread because nobody, it was never about money. Yeah. Nobody dreamt that money was unimportant. Everybody, every regulator, every politician throughout history has always known that money is super important. Nobody was going to let the like an internet like thing of money just spread in their countries, right? Um, and so fintech has always known that regulation is at the heart of financial services. And if you you have to understand that and sort of make it a key part of your business. And most of the fintech innovators in the late 90s in the PayPal era or in kind of the 2010 fintech era that the simple was started in, we all went out and found bank partners. Uh, banks, most of them, some of them are actually not that old, right? Most of the ones who have been in that space are actually banks which are like 20 years old, but some which are like 100 years old. Uh, but like, you know, found a bank partner who would effectively work with us to do the things that only a bank is allowed to do. Right. Um, uh, it, it and that's like leveraging their charter, essentially, like their banking charter, right? And it's leveraging their charter, but kind of like exactly how do you leverage their charter uh, in two ways. One is to do things that it is not possible to do legally without a charter. Um, so, for example, uh, you, you know, taking deposits, right, and just holding somebody's money usually requires a charter or a state license of some sort. Lending money again, usually requires a charter or a state license of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, and the third thing is actually getting access to the national payments networks, right? So every country has some payments networks uh, and then there's like a few, right? Like SWIFT or Visa, which connect up multiple countries. Um, all of those are usually locked down and are bank access only. That is changing, but it's it was definitely true 10 years ago and it is mostly true even now. Yeah. Um, so in the US, you don't get access to ACH or Fedwire or checks unless you have a bank license. So if you want to do anything with ACH or Fedwire or checks, you need to find a bank who will basically take your ACHs and wires and checks and send them to the Fed for you because <laughs> you can't send them to the Fed directly yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, those are the, the, the kind of the abilities that a charter brings to you. And if you want to do those things, you should be doing them with a charter. Now, some of them are like, you can't do ACH without a bank. Like it's yeah. literally, you can't send it to the Fed unless you hack the Fed, uh, which is not as easy as you might think. Um, the, uh, the, but like lending, you can always just go out and lend money. Mm -hmm. it's 
but until you get caught uh, you you can do it right um, and so i think the a lot of the the difference between fintech and crypto is really fintech just tried always to kind of work color within the lines and crypto was always like well we're going to go out and do our paintings and figure out the lines later yeah yeah no, it's super interesting. So, you know, with kind of that's a great backstory of just you and then also just how the overall banking system has worked, you know, historically to date. I'd love if you could just kind of touch how Scylla uh, fits into that and, you know, what you're trying to uh, mitigate in that process. Sure. Um, and so at its core, Scylla is an API platform. And it's, it's, most of our customers actually use our SDKs, but at the core of it, we have a set of REST over HTTP APIs. And those enable you to do things like onboard end users, verify their identities, uh, link their bank accounts and cards, and do payment transactions from those bank accounts and cards. Um, and that's, a, that's kind of a core set of functionality which almost every FinTech out there needs, and probably every crypto company as well, right? Like it's basic, Payments is the lifeblood of any business. And what we want to do is enable the, those payments to be programmed. Uh, if, to, if you want to wake up tomorrow and you want to sort of say, hey, I want to program with, I don't know, uh, program with the web, of course, building a website is easy, right? HTTP, there's, there's thousands of tools out there. You want to program with uh, text, well, there's a bunch of tools out there, but you probably start with Twilio and you could be sending texts or for emails or for uh, websites or for even voice. If you want to do something weird with like voice IVR, so there, is, there are companies which will enable you to do that. And you may not understand how those companies do it, but on the back end of it, there are internet protocols, right? Like there's an sure. HTTP, SMTP, IMAP, POP, uh, and uh, SIP, right, for voice. But, but nobody programs with those protocols directly because it's just too hard, right? And and the, the there are large companies, right? Like Twilio or uh, SendGrid and all of these who have built businesses on top of those protocols and, and enabling access to them. Um, that's exactly what we're doing. We're building that business, which it makes it easy and simple to build and ship a financial application. Because that's the end goal. The end goal is not to enable somebody to program with HTTP. Mm -hmm. The end goal is to enable somebody to build a website. <laughs> right? And right, right. To, right. I want to enable all those developers, all those people who want to build and, and as part of their business or, or their app or whatever they're building, they need payments functionality. They need to hold money. They need to move money. Uh, and, and we have US only right now. But we do plan to eventually be global and our system is designed to be global. So I don't care whether you're a developer based in Washington, D.C. or in Dar es Salaam. I want you to be able to wake up tomorrow and adding email functionality into your app might take you a day. Adding payment functionality into your app should take you maybe a couple of days, right? It should not take the years that it takes right now. Right, right. No, it's 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 super interesting and and just um you know walk walk me through how the stable currency uh, fits into this overall. So you're you're you know you're this banking layer or this the stable currency API layer essentially, correct? Exactly. And so the oh, when you when once you once you get to that goal, which is helping businesses program with money, um, then you're like, well, first of all, you you need money, right? You need a virtual form of money, right? And uh, the banks offer you that. They give you deposits in a banking account, but it's very, very hard to program. Like banks don't have APIs, uh, definitely not anything that works internationally. Um, and and as, even within the US, it's super hard, right? Mm -hmm. um, so one of the core pieces of function, like it, programming with money is impossible unless you have money. And that needs to be in a programmable format. And what is a programmable format for money? Well, what do most people understand as money? A US dollar. That's what you and I would think of as money. Right. And I'm like, well, let's create a programmable version of the US dollar. Um, and how will? And then the next question is like, well, how will that work globally? Um, because you know, the, the Indian rupee is a great form of money in India, but as soon as you go to like Europe and you offer people the ability to program with rupees, you'll find that they will be a little bit hesitant because 
rupees in outside India are not widely used, right? Yeah. Uh, but guess what? The dollar is actually the world's reserve currency. So if you offer people across the world a programmable dollar, a lot of them are going to be like, yeah, I know I live in India. I'd prefer rupees, but dollars work. Right. Uh, it, it is kind of the, lang- the, the the closest thing to a global currency we have. Yeah. So the, the, the whole goal behind the stable coin is to make that whole question go away. Right. Like, I don't want you to worry about what currency you're holding. It. The most widely accepted global currency is the dollar done. That's what your money is. Your money is a dollar. Now, what are you going to build with it? Get to that. Right. I want you to build and ship something without worrying about the underlying currency, in which case the currency should just function. I mean, currency needs to be, you know, store of value, unit of exchange, medium, uh, um, st- uh, sorry, store of uh, store of value, unit of account, medium of exchange. And it needs to be all of those things equally well. And that's what yeah. the US dollar does. Let's just adopt it, right? And the way we adopt it is as a stable coin. So every time you debit somebody's bank account using our APIs, we create a SILA token, uh, and that SILA token uh, on Ethereum, it's an ERC-20 uh, stable coin. Uh, the underlying dollars go to our bank partner, and they stay in an FPO account at our bank partner, which is Evolve Bank and Trust based in Memphis. And uh, and, and we have it set up so that the, uh, the tokens uh, are just represent an interest in the underlying account. So if you... Uh, Jonathan Blanco, verify your identity uh, and get, uh, you know, a thousand SILA tokens at your Ethereum address of, you know, that means that you have $10 which belong to you in that underlying bank account at a, at uh, at Evolve and you have full FDIC insurance on those $10. Yeah. Right? Sorry. Uh, and it's set up enable that. You said a thousand tokens would represent $10 or is there? Yes. One SILA is a cent. So we kind Got of it. went with, uh, it's so, a bit like a easy end, right? No, no, no. Um, yeah, perfect. Okay, it's cool. It's a hundred is to one, right? But the ten dollars will is will just stay in the underlying bank account. Uh, it's a fully reserved stable coin, and uh, it it you know if if Jonathan transfers it to Shamir, well, the tokens transfer on the blockchain. The dollars just stay in the underlying account, and right. then if Shamir to his Chase account or Wells Fargo account then we'll take the dollars out of the bank account and send it to Chase or Wells, right? Yeah. Using the AC. Card yeah. Or yeah. And, the, and, and even though you're using the ERC-20 token, um, it's it's basically agnostic because it's more of a representation. It's just, that's just the software essentially that you're using to to make this function, correct? Right? Like, so yeah, you could change it to any token for that matter, your own independent, if you wanted to build that out for whatever reason, so forth. It's just the, more the recording of it, correct? Completely. And and the, the ERC-20 is just an entry. It's just yeah. a way of saying, Jonathan has a balance of, you know, 1,000, Shamir has a balance of 100 and, and XYZ, right? Um, and and the underlying total of all of those balances is always in the, is always in the bank, right? Yeah. And uh, the, the power of that is that the bank has a technology system um, and it works, but it's a, you know, banks are running on 1970s era mainframes, right? Uh, they're not super programmable and they're not easy to use at all. The ERC-20 is programmable on a, in a way that a banking system just cannot imagine, right? Yeah, totally. Uh, and so the functionality that you get, I mean, the, 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 there's a huge bunch of functionality you can build on the front end and you can plug in your web and mobile apps into our APIs and use it. But then on the back end, you can also build a huge amount of functionality using the ERC-20, right? And so. Um, any financial product that you can think of is just a set of rules built around money. And you sure. say whether you call it whether you call it insurance or whether you call it lending or whatever you want to call it, it's very easy to sort of write build a financial product as like two hundred lines of code, right? Yeah. Um, Shamir and, and Jonathan and twenty others put money into this, and then if Shamir breaks a leg, then he gets some money back, right? Right. You can that as an as a program, and you can call it insurance if you want. To. Yeah. Um, and so we've seen use cases like that as well. Um, and and the, the ability to be to program with money is both a front-end ability to build applications, but also a back-end ability to do things with that money in a transparent, easy-to-use uh, format as well. Yeah, yeah, awesome, great. Well, I, that's that's a all great um, 
background to like what the hell's going on with the world today <laughs> so man it's been we, we've been trying to get this conversation you and i for the last week but we've both been busy just catching up and on what's happening um you know with the with the dumpster fire of the economy right now uh love to kind of talk through that so uh the fed just cut interest rates to zero um yesterday and then the stock market ended at what three thousand down? Is that what it ended at? I think it was down twelve percent. That much I know. Actually, this is the second biggest drop in the Dow Jones in history. Yeah, this is a bigger crash today on Monday, March sixteenth, than it was on October twenty eighth of nineteen twenty nine. Um, and October twenty eighth, nineteen twenty nine, is famous as the as the you know the, the start of the the Great Depression, the big Wall Street crash. Uh, we bet that today. Um, yeah. I, I, I would not have, if you had told me that I would see this a month ago in my lifetime, I would not have, I didn't, I didn't think we could ever see that 1987, 1929 era type of crash again, right? Uh, but here we are. And so we have seen it today. Um, and I don't think we are done yet. Uh, Black Monday, October 28th of 1929, was followed by Black Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. And it, it dropped by, I think, 12.7 or 12.8% 12 on the, uh, the Black Monday. And then on Black Tuesday, it dropped by another like 11.8% or something. So um, the, the, the only difference about the Black Monday of 1987 was that it did all of it in one day. It dropped by 22, 23% in one day, while in 1929, it dropped more, but over two days instead of one day. Um, so I would not be surprised if we see another big sell-off tomorrow. Uh, I'm hoping it's not like a Black Tuesday 10% plus, but yeah. I think a fair amount of uh, selling left in the markets before we get to rock bottom. Uh, it might be a few more months. Um, uh, and, and in fact, I, I hate to say this, but I kind of told you so, or told everybody. I tweeted about this a month ago. Uh, in late February, uh, and and now I think uh, Goldman Sachs has, <laughs> has said exactly what I said back then, which is that the U.S. is already in a recession, and Q1 will be flat, and Q2 will be negative growth, and and in fact the whole world is in a recession right now. Right, uh, is not like the last time. Um, the last time was a financial crisis caused by well lots of things, but really the mortgage markets melted down. Um, this time around, the mortgage markets are pretty healthy, and there yeah. might be other. The financial system which melted down but probably not mortgages um this is really just a you know it's a it's a it's an exogenous shock like you if, if an asteroid came out of the sky and and blew up a good chunk of the world what would happen right the markets would tank <laughs> if they yeah. were not vaporized um and the the that's kind of what's happening it's just it's not an asteroid it's a virus and uh it's always been possible it's just not happened like the last major pandemic was, I think, 1968, when we had the uh, like a couple of million people died from a flu pandemic, which also came out of China. In fact, I think like all the major pandemics of the last couple of centuries have come out of China or India, mostly China. Um, but the the 1968 one killed a couple of million people, but mostly in China and Asia. So it didn't really affect like Europe and the US. And that's where, I mean, there wasn't that much of a stock market in in India and none at all in China. Back then, right? yeah. It was a different world. Uh, the last major one that affected the US was a century ago, 1918. Um, so it's just, these things happen. They happen once every 40 years, every 75 years, something like that, who knows. Um, it's just that we're not used to it anymore, right? Like the yeah. whole World War II and post Cold War boom and globalization wave, there hasn't been one in that era. SARS, tried in the when was SARS 2005 or something uh, two I it, think two three yeah yeah that, it, it tried but they managed to get it under control quickly enough and guess what China wasn't that large a part of the global economy and it wasn't as integrated into the global economy as it is today and SARS wasn't that infectious this act this virus is actually just SARS version 2 its official name for the virus is SARS COV2 well, the last one was SARS COV1. <laughs> uh, and and yeah. so it's 96% identical to SARS um, gen from a genetic perspective. Uh, it's just that it's the 4% difference is that it's more infectious, which is yeah, bad. Yeah, oh, that's it, bad. It spreads more. And, uh, 
and and, and yeah and no doubt like that you know uh, i think caitlin long was saying on pomp's podcast that it's the um you know the needle that popped the the balloon basically right and so you know if sorry sorry if if uh, covid 19 wasn't here um you know, we probably would still be in a recession, but when you have like, or, or at least on the path towards it, how about that? The path there. Um, but you know, the problem is, yeah, when you have this thing that also on top of everything impacts people and doesn't allow them to work and, you know, no one can leave their house and this sort of thing. Um, yeah, things are going to get kind of strict here for a, for a little bit, you know, San, San Francisco just got locked down today, for example. Right. Yeah, and so. I think we see more and more um, cities on this uh, across the U.S. Um, it's it's the main worry is cities uh, because that's where like the you know the Western world and most of the world is now more urban than rural. Uh, but also, it spreads most easily in cities where there are more people. It spreads more easily. Yeah, uh, and and the whole point of this is what you know the whole all the social distancing is just to flatten the curve, right? Sure, a lot of people are going to get it. The ones who are at most risk are older people and men, actually, older men. Um, and if you get it, you need a hospital and an ICU bed. And if you get a hospital bed and an ICU bed, you probably will survive, even as an older man. Uh, but if you don't, then you probably will die, right? That, that's so the problem, right? Is that if there's not enough beds for people, that's where the issue becomes, right? And so like in, in Italy, they're already saying that, uh, you know, if you're over 80, um, you know, chances are there's not going to be, you're not going to receive much help. Well, yeah, sorry, they're, they're, they're saying that they're going to get close to that point is what that article said. But Exactly. And it's, it's already happening in Italy where, you know, the, the, the ICU beds are maxed out, hospital beds are maxed out. Everybody who's like on anything where it's like, you know what, your, your leg is broken and your interaction, get out of here and go back home. We don't care about you anymore. Uh, but like they've done everything they can. And then there are still more people getting it. And so now, these last few days in Italy, doctors have been having to make the worst choices possible, which you usually only have to do in wartime, which is, hey, there's two people, both of whom need a respirator. I only have one respirator. Who's going to live and who's going to die? Yeah. Because one who doesn't get the respirator almost certainly will die. And they, they're like, well, if there's one of them is 80 and the other is 60, the 60-year-old gets it. And what happens to the 80-year-old? Yeah. And it's just, it's those sorts of decisions are obviously horribly traumatic. Um, and typically it only happens in war, right? Like when there's lots and lots of people dying and doctors do what they can for whom they can. And, and, and you know, army doctors are kind of used to that. General civilian doctors in a hospital in, in Milan are just not used to having to ever do that in their lifetimes. Sure. Uh, but that's what's well, happening. And that's and, the whole goal is to kind of just flatten the curve so that by the time you get sick, the person who got sick before you has left the hospital bed. So there's one available for you, right? Yeah. And prevent the hospitals from collapsing. Sure, sure. Um, so what do you think this means for the overall, um, you know, just in your background, like the banking system and the banking sector overall? Like, so in, in that, in the most recent Fed decision, it was basically told a bunch of banks like, hey, like you can't buy your own stocks, for example, right? Which is, you know, kind of funny that you would need to tell them that. But it's like, hey, we're going to give you a stimulus so that you can just buy your own stock. Well, um, the point being, like the banks are usually about 90% debt and 10% or less equity, right? Mm -hmm. 95%. Uh, and so banks are basically a big leveraged bet on the economy. Because where, does the, where do they, whom do they lend to? Everybody, right? Like yeah. mostly business, but some individuals as well. Um, and you're like, well, if the economy goes into a tank and a lot of businesses end up going bust, um, then by definition, those banks are also going to end up going bust, right? Like, yeah. and, and, the, and if you have like 90% debt to equity ratio and 10% of your, and you take a 10% loss on your balance sheet, your equity is wiped out. And now if you take a, 20% loss, well, what's going to happen to the 10% of the 10% of the debt is also <laughs> taking a loss, right? So, so sure. it, 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 that's just basic math. And so between like 1865 and 1907, every seven to 10 years, the US had a recession. And every seven to 10 years, the US had a banking crisis, 
Because every time there was a recession, there would be a run on the banks. Lots of banks would go bust. Like the, all that we saw in 08 and in 1932, 33, that it used to happen every seven years. It was not like unusual. Banking panics were a, a fact of life. <laughs> it's like, yeah. and, and so, but nobody liked that. Nobody wanted like a banking panic and crisis is like a really big bad thing. So finally, in 1912, they created the Federal Reserve and the, the whole goal behind it was to make sure that the panic of 07 never happened again. The Fed did a decent job getting us through World War I and the 20s. Couldn't fully stop the, the crisis of 32, 33. They didn't, didn't understand economics and crises well enough, really, was the real problem. Um, and so then we had the Great Depression and then the New Deal and all the legislation that came out of it. And that worked for 70, 80 years until 08, right? And we had another financial crisis. Uh, in between, we had lots of recessions. We had recessions after 1945. Uh, I mean, so many, right? But yeah. it usually did not lead to a financial crisis and a financial panic until 08. Um, this time around, I don't really know. But I suspect that there will be, just because this recession is going to be way worse than 08 and I, it might be as bad as the 30s, right? Uh, just because we've never, nobody has, like an entire country of 60 million people, Italy, is currently shut down. Yeah. Two weeks ago, if you had told me this, I would not have believed it was possible. And I think within a month or two, the US is going to be pretty close. I, I think it's within like days or weeks, man. Like, it's like seriously, like, because if you, if you think about the Bay Area, how that just got closed down, um, Seattle's not far behind. In fact, Seattle arguably should already be shut down. Um, and and yeah. what, what my, I was talking about this with someone and, um, you know, Americans or, you know, you know, those of us, of us who live here, it's, um, we're not used to being forced in what we do or, you know, we can do whatever we want. Like no one tells us what to do. Right. And so, uh, you know, part of it is like, Hey, like it needs to be got done in these like slow little micro doses of what's happening. And, um, you know, every, every path seems to seem like, Hey, there's going to be more cities locked down like, uh, San yeah. Francisco. But see, that's the thing, right? Like the, 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 what's the, uh, like the medical uh, way, like, you know, make uh, cut once and cut deep, right? Yeah. Um, like that's, that's what Italy did, right? Like initially when they first had a spike in, I think it was February 22nd, I was actually in Switzerland and I remember like realizing, my God, this is like really next door. Oh my God. <laughs> so I came back to the US, right? Um, and thankfully I haven't been sick. I have had no symptoms. So I'm, I'm, cool. yeah. I'm not, a, not a super spreader yet. Yeah. Um, but like um, the, Italy, when it first had its first spike, they were like, oh, this is not a big deal. We don't need to do anything. A week later, they were like, oh, this is a big deal. We need to shut down like Milan. Or then after a while, they were like, we need to shut down Lombardy. But when they shut down Lombardy and I think the neighboring provinces, like they, they that news actually leaked. And so when they shut down 25% of the country, Sorry, uh, the way, yeah. people who knew were, that it was being shut down the next day immediately went up left Lombardy and the northern parts um, and spread out across Italy, going back to their homes. And because they did that, it didn't work. Yeah. Right? They didn't contain it uh, in Lombardy and then it started spreading all across Italy. And so now it's not just, uh, that's why if they could have just gone to Mil like Lombardy on like February 22nd and been like, shut the whole place down, Nobody leaves, nobody enters, like they did in Wuhan, in China. Like they shut down the whole of Hubei province. And now there are more coronavirus deaths in Seattle than there are in Beijing. Yeah. Why? Because they shut down the entire province of tens of millions of people, didn't let anybody in or out, and took very drastic measures in late Jan, right? Yeah. Was well, yeah, I had um, uh, Matthew Graham on my podcast on Friday, and he was telling me how he's trying to get his mother to go to China where he lives because he feels like she would be safer there with him. Like probably true than, than here, which is crazy. It's crazy to think about. Right. So it is probably yeah. true. There's, there's mass testing available. Um, they're, they're the most advanced in terms of figuring out a cure or whatever. And they have the best systems in place to prevent it from spreading. And their hospitals four weeks from now are not going to be maxed out capacity. 
pretty much every hospital in the US is going to be well, it depends on where you are because it's going yeah. to in different ways at different times uh, and all the actions that are being taken now will slow it down right 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 what i'm most worried about now is kind of it's, it's weird to think of a virus as a partisan issue like a virus doesn't care what you believe it will kill you anyway yeah right <laughs> well like ted cruz retweeted something that aoc said right uh alexandria otasio cortez right and like and actually a couple of weeks ago they were arguing about something so it was really funny we were like oh my god the four horsemen are coming because <laughs> you know you retweeted that but, but the, yeah it's definitely interesting times the well, thing is, a lot of like you know the the kind of the southern states and um, are, are still not treating this seriously enough. I mean, there was a picture I saw of like uh, some place in the south, which is a you know a spring break destination, and the beaches are full of people on spring. Break. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There is. I mean, the governor of Oklahoma took a picture on Saturday of him at like this really busy uh, restaurant with his family, and like we're you know standing up to this X Y Z, and you know people lost their mind, <laughs> and then on Sunday he deleted it. He deleted that photo. But uh, yeah, and I, and I'm and I'm like, look, the, the the thing to do is to figure out all the most extreme measures you can think of and do them really. Because if you do, them I really totally agree. Slow it down, then you can get off them. Yeah, like, look at China now; they're opening up Hubei. Right? Yeah, no, I totally agree. Yeah, it's 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 crazy. We'll see what happens. Well, hey, Shamir. Oh, look, you have a little visitor back there. <laughs> Thank you. Brought you some water and chocolate. Yes. Nice. Hi. Yeah, ch- water and a, I got water and a chocolate croissant. Oh, nice. These are, these are the perils of working from home. Yeah. Uh, or the advantages, depending. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, hey, Shamir, I'll let you get back to your family then. I super appreciate you uh, coming on the podcast. Um, we'll definitely have to do this again sometime soon, and just keep keep chatting about this. Uh, anything you want to leave our, our listeners with or any questions that you want to make them think about? Well, I mean, it's kind of like, of course, we are in a crisis and we'll be in it for a while and we're going to go into it before we can get out of it, right? Yeah. Uh, and it, we have to hit rock bottom and then we can get out. But this is also like different from 08 in the sense that 08 was caused by the financial system screwing up. And then, you know, we, it took a while to kind of unwind and coming out of it took a fairly long amount. I think at least this time the financial parts of the financial system may or may not go bust because of like the, the, the massive shock to the economy. Um, but coming out of it, you know, there's the virus will go. I mean, eventually, you know, even all of these things may last three months, six months, 12 months, a year. They won't, they don't last for 10 years. Right. Right. So eventually, and I don't know if it's Q3 of 19 or Q1 of 2020, everybody will have to get back to work and we'll have to rebuild from and, and and thankfully this is not like world war ii where we have to build a lot of infrastructure the buildings will still be standing the roads will still be here we just have to get back to work yeah. um, and when we do i think the, the the companies that survive and the companies that work um sort of uh that, that that keep working away on adding value are the ones who are going to be the best place i was talking with my co-founders today about this and one of them made the analogy that we are like the we're a, we a tiny, tiny company. We're only six months old. We have 14, 15 employees. Um, and so, and but we are well-funded. We will be here for the next two years at least. Uh, so we're not worried about that. Um, and it, it, he was like, you know, we are like a, we are like a tiny uh, squirrel when the asteroid hits, right? Uh, the, the whole goal is to survive the, the nuclear wind. Be the cockroach. You got to be the cockroach, man. And I like this squirrel because I'm like, you've got to survive. And then you can be the map, right? And you can take yeah. over the entire ecosystem once all the dinosaurs have been uh, wiped out. So I think yeah. we'll see some dinosaurs wiped out. I'm planning to be the squirrel. Nice. All right. Uh, hey, look at that guy. <laughs> 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 all right man well hey thanks so much we'll see you soon and i uh, really appreciate that uh everybody else thank you so much for watching and listening uh we're going to be producing lots of great content like this with amazing uh founders uh investors and influencers across finance uh blockchain and crypto and just really everything because there's so much awesome news to do so again shamir we'll talk to you soon thanks a lot thank you always a pleasure